And my father was in the Air Force, and he was stationed here at Roswell at the time in 47. Uh, he was assigned as part of the cleanup crew out at the site. He had the highest security clearance that their force gives, but uh, he was never able, nor did he ever attempt to discuss the incident. He passed away in 1988. He had uh, his last tour of duty was in Vietnam, where he acquired Agent Orange. Ended up with a, uh, cancer of the spine. He did not want to die at home. And as he was laying on the gurney waiting to be loaded into the ambulance, he told me, he said, baby, he said, the story is true. He said, don't let anybody try to tell you any different. He said, the incident happened. There was a spacecraft. And I kissed him, and that's the last I got to talk to my dad. Hi. My name is Jerry Croth. I'm a professor of uh, psychology in Santa Clara University in California. Um, and uh, this, I've written 13 books, usually academic. This one is brand new, 2017. And it starts with a very, very personal experience that happened to me 52 years ago. So uh, this is before my doctorate. I, um, I'm teaching the fifth grade. And a little girl comes up to me with a piece of material about five inches square, and she says, my daddy says I should show this to you. And I, I, I was, what, 25 years old, 24 years old? And uh, I, I thought it was aluminum foil, and I said, oh, thank you very much. She said, well, why don't you crush it? So I crushed it into a ball. She said, let it go, let it go. And it just absolutely opened up. No creases, nothing. I said, whoa, that's not aluminum foil. What is that? She said, try to put a hole in it. So I took a ballpoint pen, tried to jab. I mean, this is paper thin, like a piece of stationery. Silvery gray, a little bit rubbery. Not too much, a little bit. And I stabbed it, and nothing happened. It just went like that. And then it disappeared when you took the ballpoint pen away. She said, try to cut it. I said, is that okay with your daddy? And she said, yeah. So I took up my scissors and I tried to cut it and it just bent. You could not cut it. I tried three different kinds of scissors. So I th said, thank you. And uh, I didn't think anything more about it for probably 45 years. I thought her father probably worked at NASA and it was probably some kind of uh, uh, experimental material. And I saw, honestly, I had no interest in UFOs and nothing. Uh, so, I'm working on my first book about UFOs that was published in, uh, in 2010. And I'm reading something that's kind of strange that suggests that this material has the properties of the Roswell crash and the Roswell foil, which gave rise to this book. Now, I want to fill you in on a few more details. I thought, I'm going to try to find this girl. Well, that was my class, what, 52 years ago. And there are people on Facebook who still maintain contact. I, I thought I taught fourth grade. They said, no, you taught fifth grade. And uh, there's some people who know all the names of all those people. They have their... Facebook alumni page. And they said her name was Denise Daly, and she was not in school very long, and uh, nobody knows where she is. He's, they think that her father worked for the military. Well, 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 isn't that interesting? Uh, so I talked to a Hollywood producer who, who wanted to put this thing on TV. I said, I, I haven't even, even finished my book yet. He said, I know a private detective. He'll try to find Denise Daly. She had a twin sister named Veronica or Patricia Daly, Michigan, St. Mary of Wayne School, 1965. 
Couldn't find her. A Latvian, a Latvian private detective uh, offered his services for free. He's interested in UFOs. He found about 15 Denise Dailies. I called them all. I emailed them all. Nothing. Okay, so who did your father work for? What kind of material was that? I, and the fact is, I have never, ever seen this material again. So I started researching it, and I need to tell you that I decided, let's be scientific. I, uh, I teach research methods at my university, and so I'm very familiar with good research and bad. So I sent out queries to professors of material science, physicists, chemists, and I said, what was I holding in 1965? And I didn't say anything about Roswell. 50% of them wrote back and said, I have no idea. 16% said, we think it's nitinol, a combination of uh, titanium and nickel material. Others said it was mylar. A senior scientist from DuPont said it was hytrail, Kapton, Kevlar. I bought all that stuff. I have a piece of Kevlar here, but I, I guess I don't have it with me. I bought all those things, I uh, looked at them all, and I'm afraid to say none of them have these properties. Mylar creases. This material did not crease, it would refuse to crease. Same with Kevlar, it's too thick. Nitinol is too brittle. Kapton doesn't make it. Hytrel doesn't make it. Nothing that I bought, tried, comes close to this. And the fact is, I have never seen it in 51 years. Why? It would be so great as a shirt. It would be so great as a raincoat or a roof covering or to coat a car with it. It would never scratch. I have never seen this material again in my life. And that's 52 years, half century. So here's where this all starts. I was reading my book in 2008 and I'm reading this crazy man named Philip Corso. He's 80 years old, writing a book called The Day After Roswell. And he's saying he was there, and the crash happened, and there were aliens, three, and one of them crawled out, and they shot it. And, uh, and they did autopsies on the bodies. They had four fingers and no genitals and large heads and white lymphatic fluid instead of blood. And I thought, why are you reading this junk? This is just junk, pseudoscientific nonsense. And then I read a paragraph. And this is the origin of this book that I wrote. This is the paragraph that I read in 2008. One of the materials he's talking about at the Roswell crash site, one of the materials discovered was a dull gray metallic cloth-like material that seemed to shine up from the sand. The officer at the wreckage stuffed it into his fist and rolled it into a ball. Then he released it and the metallic fabric snapped back into shape without any creases or folds. When I tried to cut it with scissors, the arms just slid off without making even a nick in the fiber. When I tried to stretch it, it bounced back. I said, oh my God, I had that material in my hands in 1965, and I have never seen it again. That's the origin of this book and of this video. So let's talk a little more about Roswell, because in my research, uh, I discovered there were 37 people who experienced this for. There were about 10 pieces of this material uh, that were found, and most were turned over to the Air Force, but a couple slipped by. So here's what these people say. Way back in 1947, it could not be torn or cut at all. Extremely lightweight, about four or five inches square. Well, that's what I had. A sort of aluminum-like foil. Most of it was kind of double-sided material. Foil-like on one side and rubber-like on the other. Both sides were grayish, silver in color. The foil more silvery than rubber. The foil rubber material could not be torn. Well, that's what I had. You could take that stuff and wad it up and it would straighten itself out. That person, in 47, signed an affidavit in 1998. Perhaps aluminized cloth, another said. Well, that sounds right to me too.
It was interesting. I did get to handle the material. He's an actual witness. The material had some peculiar properties. For instance, it looked like Hershey bar wrappings. And, but you squeeze it up in your hand as hard as you could, let go, and it returned originally to the original shape instantly. That's called shape memory, by the way. Then the next day, Jesse brought some of the stuff into the intelligence office. And uh, so we looked at it and played with it a while, and then everybody went back to work. Later that day, boom. Nobody knows anything. You just shut up. Nothing happened, uh, etc. And when you're in the service, you do what they say to do. So, um, this book then uh, takes on a much larger character. I start with the foil, but then I start talking about what if all this happened. So, if you haven't heard about the Roswell episode, 1947, uh, a crowd... Uh, there are UFOs flying around the Roswell base. It's the only atomic nuclear base in the world. That's where the Enola Gay was stationed, the one that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. UFOs are flying around. One gets hit by lightning and crashes. So uh, that's the story, which was followed by denials. But there was a press release that said... A flying saucer crashed. And then, of course, they retracted it the next day. So there are many, many witnesses. I think I have a total in my book of 78 witnesses that say the Roswell crash actually did happen. I think it's the largest aggregation of witnesses of any text that I've ever re read. And uh, luckily, I wrote this one. Here are a few people who talk about that. Field. And this uh, gentleman called and said he was a mortuary officer at the base. He needed some information. I said, what do you need? And he said, uh, how many uh, hermetically sealed infant caskets do you have? Three and a half, four foot in stock. And I said, we don't have any. How long would it take you to get them? And I said, well, I can call Amarillo at 10, by 3.30 this afternoon and have them in here in the morning. I said, what's going on? He said, that's not important. I said, well, it is important also, but anyway. Called back later and he said, uh, I need more information. And uh, you want to know what embalming chemicals that would alter the tissue, the stomach contents, and what is our preparation for uh, taking care of bodies and laying out in the elements for several days. And I said, you're the mortuary officer and you're asking. Uh, this other person was a chief intelligence officer. I told the, the, the newspapers, I mean the newsmen, what it was, and to forget about it. It was nothing more than a weather well, observation balloon. Of course, which we, we both knew differently. Major Marcel had to keep silent because of his strategic position at that time. He was in charge of all security and intelligence on atomic tests in the United States and the Pacific. It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of. Because I was being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This is nothing like that. It could not be. It, it could not have been. I decided to not limit this book to Roswell. I really wanted to say, if extraterrestrials have made contact with Earth, it is probably the biggest story of our lifetime, of this millennium, of, of the history of the human race. So let's go beyond Roswell. So if you look through the literature of relatively respectable people, you start finding a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, for 30 years, I've held that image in my mind. What I saw was a circular object that looked like two pie plates put on top of each other with a golf ball on top. It was a classic flying saucer, and it shot a beam of something at our warhead. That's an Air Force officer flying a strategic Air Command bomber. That's not just a person who's crazy or an alcoholic or trying to write a bestseller, okay?
I am convinced that these objects do exist and that they are not manufactured by any nation on earth. I can therefore see no alternative to accepting the theory that they come from some extraterrestrial source. Lord Downing, Royal Air Force. There are a lot of respectable people. However, I'm a scientist or a social scientist and I have a, a need to be objective. So I tried to get in touch with skeptics and doubters and debunkers. And they're not very nice people. <laughs> I met James Oberg. Now, if you're uh, a little bit agnostic on this question or you have an open mind, boy, talk about hostility. Well, you're, uh, I mean, I really had some difficulty with Oberg. And uh, he, uh, nonetheless, I wanted to hear what he had to say because he said these things did not happen. These people did not say these things. And I wanted to get that information. Finally, Oberg and I, after about 20 emails, had a bit of a detente. But he had a lot of important things to say that are really worth listening to. Uh, for example, the UFO community which I, and I'm not a member, says things like, this is what Neil Armstrong allegedly said on the moon. These babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. James Lovell, another astronaut, says, we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high. Well, Oberg has pointed out, these guys never said those things, or they didn't mean these things, or they were taken out of context, and they're proliferated on the UFO community on the internet, day in and day out, all over the place, and they just never happened. So you've got to pay attention to debunkers and skeptics, and I thank James Oberg for his contributions. However, I started to say, well, if, if they didn't say that, what does YouTube have to say? Because there are people saying things in their own words, and you can't say they were misquoted. Robert Porter on YouTube flew the alien bodies from Texas, Roswell, New Mexico to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and there he is on YouTube saying that is what he did. Gordon Cooper is an astronaut on YouTube saying he believes in UFOs. Russian cosmonaut to the left, Russian cosmonaut to the lower right, YouTube saying they encountered UFOs in their own words. So in doing my research, the witness testimony is piling up and these are not just crazy people out in the street. These are generals and admirals and submarine commanders and astronauts and cosmonauts. Here's a pile. Passenger, I don't know. I really don't you, know. you weren't the only person who saw no, this phenomenon, were, right. were you? There, no. there, there were some passengers who saw it, and yeah. also another pilot. Yes, simultaneously. Well, look, let's, we've got an artist's impression that we knocked up here this afternoon on our, our computer paint box. Um, is that kind of what you saw? Is that a uh, reasonable? No. <laughs> oh well, we, the best we did. I'll be honest. Yeah. You, well, hold that picture. Well, you, 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 you describe it. Uh, to us. Well, it was a, a brilliant uh, yellow object. The, the brightness you've got there, about two thirds from left to right. Um, yeah, but it was a graphite grey uh, section, if you want to call it a fuselage. We don't know yet what it was. Uh, we're looking into it. And how big was it? Uh, it's difficult to say once again, but I saw it from 50 miles away. So um, any object from 50 miles away must have been fairly enormous. Well, what, about a mile long? It's possible, yeah. Did it it's, move at all? It probably didn't move, but uh, there, I had uh, the great opportunity the other day from Jersey Air Traffic Control uh, visiting their radar uh, room and uh, some interesting... Um, traces, let's put it that way, from, from the radar, uh, really? indicate that there's a possibility that they did pick up on, from both Guernsey and Jersey radar, uh, traces, uh, spurious traces they call, um, for around about 55 minutes. How long uh, did you see it for? I saw it in total for 12 minutes. Okay, so uh, as we start looking at expert testimony and insider testimony, uh, it just starts building and building and building and building. Barry Goldwater was a conservative san senator. He was also a pilot and a major general in the Air Force Reserve. And he knew all the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He knew all the top people in the Pentagon. He appropriated money for them. And he believed in UFOs. Here's an interview what he, about what he said about Roswell. But I think that uh, at Wright-Patterson Field 
if you could get into certain places, you'd find out what the Air Force and the government knows about UFOs. Reportedly, a spaceship landed. It was all hushed up, quieted, and nobody ever, have never heard about much of it. I called Curtis LeMay and I said, General, uh, I know we have a room at Wright-Patterson where you put all this secret stuff. Could I go in there? I've never heard him get mad, but he got madder than hell at me, cussed me out, said, don't ever ask me that question again. Well, dost thou protest too much? So, in the looking at expert testimony, I decided to uh, look at the best UFO stories. What are the best UFO stories? Well, from an objective perspective, the best UFO story is not one person's anecdotal account. It's corroboration. If there are lots of people and intelligent people and expert people who saw it, that makes a, a, a more uh, viable story. So the best UFO stories in my list, Russian sightings, Roswell, Iceland, Montana, Australia, the Indian Val uh, Valley, Indian Point sightings, uh, and so forth. So I would, instead of recapitulating this whole chapter, which is pretty long, uh, here's just one incident that I have in my book. Iceland, 1951, a guy's flying with 30 passengers, that he has like five or six pilots and navigators on board. They're uh, being, some of them are just passengers. And he's flying from uh, Iceland to Newfoundland, okay? And he spots something that looks like a city in, the, uh, in a very remote region of the uh, ocean. And he says, are we off course? That looks like a city down there. And all of a sudden, the lights of the city go off as he's coming closer to it. And instead, a single UFO comes towards him and almost hits him. And I mean, he, I mean, he takes it off automatic pilot and some people are even ducking for cover. So here's his video. Or maybe the tip of Greenland. So he said, no, we were right on course. So we watched it for a while and we were drifting to the right of it, and where our heading was 222 degrees, 225 degrees in that, that direction. Um, as we became, I would say, we were at 10,000 feet, I would say it was 40 miles away originally, and it was very large. I mean, just, I, was, it's, I couldn't estimate the size of it. So I sent the, uh, the crew chief back to get the plane, other plane commander, Al Jones, because they wanted to land at Argentia. So when the crew was coming up from back half, there were 31 passengers, and, and, and we had two VP crews, which had pilots also, and patrol plane pilots. And uh, at the time that they came forward, the lights went out on the water. There was nothing on the water. This was about 15 miles away. I mean, it was just dark. Now, standing behind me was the navigator, the radioman, and also the plane captain, plus them, the cockpit was full and there were heads all over the place and, and all of a sudden we saw on the water a yellow halo that was very very small about 15 miles away and it came up to 10,000 feet like that that a fraction of a second and I thought it was going to go right through us and I disengaged the autopilot push your nose over because I was going to go under it at the angle it was coming toward me so what happened the minute that I did that, it was up at our altitude, and I could see nothing outside of the cockpit but this craft. And and uh, and uh, so I didn't know which way to go. And then all of a sudden, I heard a racket. I didn't know what it was. I said, Fred, what the hell was that? He he looked around. And he says, Oh, he said everyone was ducking in the back of us, and they collided. They're all laying on the deck, <laughs> deck back there, scrambling on the deck. So when I looked back, it wasn't there. And he says, It's over here on the right hand side. Now, it was about a mile or so away on the right-hand side, and it kind of drifted forward maybe to a position maybe five miles away, and that's where it stayed with us for quite some time. This is when we could first see it wasn't above our, our altitude. It was below our altitude, but it was still above the horizon where you could see the side of the craft. You could see the dome, 
and you can see the color around the, the, the perimeter of the craft. And l then we knew that it was a friendly encounter. We knew it knew we were there. We knew it came out to see us. So we we watched it for a while, and and Al says, "Well, let me let him get in the seat." So I let him get in the seat, and and uh, and uh, he disengaged the autopilot. Was going to chase it. Well, now we we had a ground speed of his head went about 60 knots. So our ground speed was maybe only 120, 130 knots. And so he wasn't going to go too far in chasing this thing, but he did turn to chase it. So I decided I would go back there to see how the passengers reacted, and also talk to the doctor that was back there. He used to make the trip over there. He had a daughter going to school in London. And, and uh, so I went to him first. I said, Doc, did you uh, see what we saw? And he says, yeah. He says, you look me straight in the eye. He says, yeah. He says, it was a flying saucer. Now, the reason I included that, not only does that band sound very convincing and not trying to write some kind of a fancy book, uh, but he a, a, well, sounds like a very rational man, doesn't he? Now, if they dug up on a, uh, the, a report which was basically saying that this happened, and it was signed. If you look at the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven officers on that plane all testified to the same thing. To me, that's good evidence. That's corroborated evidence. It's official. It's on paper. We have it in uh, the man's own words. And so I collected that kind of information for this book. Okay, now, another source of evidence is what, I mean, you can't exactly prove that the UFO happened. Somebody will come along and say, no, you misperceived, or you lied, or you just didn't understand, or you're making it up, or it's a hoax. All right, but another approach is negative evidence. That is something you can prove. You might not be able to prove that a UFO happened, but you can prove that the government lied about it. Okay, that is something that is much more definitive. We've all heard about Project Blue Book. It was a project sponsored by the Air Force. It looked at thousands of UFO sightings. It basically concluded that all of the UFO sightings were explainable, that there are no such things as flying saucers. Okay, and most people who don't believe in UFOs point to Project Blue Book and they say, aha, see, there it is. There's the proof. They don't exist. You guys are crazy. Well, the head scientist at Project Blue Book was named Robert uh, Alan Hynek. He was on that project for 20 years. After the Blue Book was published, he had a, an attack of conscience and he said, uh, Folks, I fraud. It was a scientific pretense. And the whole effort of Project Blue Book was to debunk everything. That was its intent. That was what I was doing. And he, it's, it's almost like he begged for forgiveness. He became a UFO advocate a few years after Project Blue Book. There were a lot of other projects we'd never heard of. Project Garnet, Gleam, Magnet, Moondust, Pounce, Signs, Sunstreak, Bear, Aquarius. This thing did not go away. It's just that that was the publicity. Another piece of negative evidence, which is just absolutely stunning. Stunning. Uh, there was in Bentwaters, England, we, uh, there was a nuclear air force base, the largest nuclear air force base in Europe, still is, and in the 1980s, the, uh, there was a UFO sighted over a few days near this uh, base. Now, the base commander was named Colonel Halt. And uh, people said, well, we heard about it. Uh, but did it happen? I mean, what did the Air Force say? And the Air Force denied anything that existed. There were no reports, no videos, nothing made, didn't happen. But... A Freedom of Information inquiry discovered that Colonel Halt actually wrote a report, a two or three page report, and that, that became evidence. But what's even more interesting is that Colonel Halt retired from the Air Force, and after he retired, boy, he had a lot to say. This is Colonel Halt. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Charles I. Halt. I retired from the U.S. Air Force in 1991 as a colonel. 
During my military career, I was base commander of two large installations, and at the time of my retirement, I was as a deputy base commander. In December 1980, in the, early in the morning, several of our security policemen discovered strange lights in the forest in East Anglia, just outside the back, and approached the craft. They reported it being triangular, approximately three meters on a side, dark metallic in appearance, with strange markings. They observed it for a period of time, and it very quickly and silently vanished at high speed. Initially, I was not aware of all the details. I was only told of strange lights, and I was sure there was a logical explanation. Two nights later at the family Christmas party, we were interrupted. The on-duty flight commander for the security police squadron, Lieutenant Bruce England, came and approached the base commander and I. He was white as a sheet. He said, it's back. He said, what's back? He said, the UFO. I took several security policemen with me, a disaster preparedness NCO who took an APN-27, a Geiger counter, and a camera. I also had my small cassette recorder I carried everywhere when I was on duty. Uh, I was taken to the supposed site. We found indentations approximately an inch and a half deep, approximately six to eight feet on a side, and radiation of eight to nine times normal background radiation. Not enough to be dangerous to somebody, but significant. We also found broken branches on the trees. While we were milling around trying to make sense of the whole thing, one of the individuals with me suddenly spotted something. Off through the forest was a bright, glowing object. The best way I can describe it, it looked like an eye. It was bright red with a dark center. It appeared to be winking. It would sort of wink. It was shedding something like molten metal. It was dripping off it. It silently moved through the trees, avoiding any contact. It bobbed up and down, and at one point it actually approached us. We tried to get closer. It receded out into the field, beyond the forest, and silently exploded into five white objects. Gone. So we went out into the field looking for any evidence, because something had apparently been falling off it, and we'd, we found nothing. But while we were searching around in the field, one of the people with me noticed some objects in the sky to the north. There were three or four objects in the north, brightly colored, changing from elliptical to round, and moving at very high speed and sharp angular movements as though they were doing a grid search. While we were watching them, somebody else noticed to the south there were two objects just sort of hovering in the sky. One object approached us at very high speed, best guess is three to 5,000 feet, somewhere in that neighborhood, stopped directly overhead and sent down a concentrated beam at our feet. It was about one foot in diameter. The best way I can equate it is sort of a laser beam. We stood there in awe. Was this a warning? Was this an attempt to communicate? Was this a weapon or just a probe? Just as suddenly as it appeared, click, it disappeared. We stood there, ah, really concerned. So uh, that's a large, uh, a lot more than was in his report that was discovered. But it's quite clear that the Air Force said, no, 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 nothing happened. Now, if you believe the Air Force, fine. If you believe this man, then you've got a decision to make. Uh, UFOs are real or UFOs are bunk? That is the biggest question you can, you can ask yourself and you can answer for yourself. So in all of my research, there are lots of stories. There are 10,000 people who said they saw the Phoenix Lights. There are 13,000 people who said they saw, who, who are estimated to have seen the Belgian UFOs. There are 3,500 pilots who have anonymously reported UFOs. There are 7,500 people who have seen UFOs over the Indian Valley area. And I didn't include any of them. I was only looking for hard evidence, real people with real names who are not anonymous and where it's not confidential. Okay, so I don't have that many people in my list. I have 240 witnesses from the general public. This is not hearsay. These are not secondhand stories. These are real people with real names. 
So imagine 240 people saying the crafts were the size of aircraft carriers. It was so close you could hit it with a tennis ball. It was the size of several football fields. I watched it for over 20 minutes. It blocked out the sky. It hovered. It took off at tremendous speeds. I was looking at it less than 100 yards from my disabled car. One lar big, large boomerang. I said to my wife, this must be a mile long. Now, in addition to those 240 witnesses, I also made a separate database of expert witnesses, majors, captains, lieutenants, pilots, air traffic controllers. These are people who have uh, perceptual skills better than the average guy on the street who says, oh, I see something up there, okay? We airbrushed out pictures and shadows of UFOs before releasing the pictures to the public. I've flown 747s and never seen anything like this in my life. We saw it for 55 minutes. The thing was as large as an aircraft carrier. We tracked it on radar and had it targeted when it flew to 10,000 feet and then back down to 500 within seconds. Possibly the length of two aircraft carriers and the width of one. I saw the bodies at Wright-Patterson. It was bigger than anything I've ever seen. And your gut, you could just tell it was otherworldly. Okay, and now I'll go all the way to the bottom here. It shut down 10 ICBMs within seconds. It was metallic, silver, and saucer-shaped. So I had in my database 254 members of the general public, 228 expert witnesses, a total of 482 people. And I didn't cover all of them, but I covered the most highly corroborated incidents. By the way, 92 of these testimonials are in their own words on YouTube. Okay, so here's the guided fantasy. Do you remember Watergate? It was a hearing. It had 60 witnesses. They were called, and it resulted either in the impeachment of the first uh, the president of the United States or his resignation. Richard Nixon was the first president of the United States ever to resign. And it came out of the Watergate's hearings. Now, just imagine that we have fair hearings, congressional hearings, where we call in 482 witnesses. That's what, eight times more than you saw in Watergate. And we allow their, or their deceased, many of them, we allow their relatives to read their affidavits, which they signed before they died. And the testimony is given. Okay? 482 witnesses called. Now just imagine, no redacted documents what, whatsoever. What do you think the conclusion? I believe the conclusion of that congressional investigation would be a foregone conclusion. And I believe this is what the conclusion would be. It is the conclusion of this committee, even if, even if debunkers were invited and said, no, it's a hoax, no, it was ball lightning, no, it was swamp gas, no, they're misperceiving, no, it was a hoax. I believe that the result of this hearing, this hypothetical hearing, would be this. It is the conclusion of this committee that extraterrestrial visitations of Earth have occurred and our planet has and continues to be visited by what appears to be a benevolent alien civilization. If you can imagine that, that would be the biggest news of your lifetime, my lifetime, and, uh, and of the last few millennia in, in uh, the history of our species, of civilized man. All right, now I'm going to conclude this section. Most UFO books end at this point, not mine. This is just part one. Here are just a couple of UFO videos. I don't know if they're authentic or not. It's impossible to tell. But just to, uh, to give you a little shot at what UFO videos might look like, here are a couple. I've had a couple people who are very skeptical say, I, I think these could be real. There are many, many, many such videos on the internet, but according to one of my very, very skeptical colleagues, um, many, many of them are 
computer enhanced and driven and fake and hoaxes. So it's it's really difficult to decide what's what's real and isn't. So part two of this book is what happens to the world if you accept that extraterrestrials have visited? What happens to mythology, history, ancient history, archaeology, biology, and science in general? How does it change our life if we realize that many of the stories that we considered fables and fantasies might have actually happened? So let's go to mythology first. Now we're looking at the part of our cognitive world that is going to be shattered and changed by this realization. Well, we have in our, in our mythology 60 gods, at least, who come from the sky and came to earth. And we consider all of that just human fantasy. It's just human exaggeration, hyperbole. Okay, Apollo, Artemis, uh, Zeus, Dionysius, Diana, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, Marduk, Mitra, Quetzalcoatl, Thor. All right, we consider those mythic characters. We don't think of them as real. No one really thinks of them as real, except religious believers uh, who believe that these people were gods. But these are all recorded events of sky gods who came to Earth. Okay, does that if we accept the fact that extraterrestrials have visited, does that change our understanding of mythology? Here's stories from the Bible. They're basically, by scientific, rational people, they're considered fantasies. And, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. Hmm. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Well, do you start thinking that these things might have actually happened and that's way, the way they talked about it 2,500 years ago? Ezekiel's wheel, it's in the Old Testament. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go. And the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. So again, we start thinking, my God, what if that actually did happen? There are, in, in my review of the literature, there are 23 sky gods across the world, the, uh, across ancient literature, who uh, helped human beings, taught them. They were tutors. Uh, they taught us how, the bow, bow and arrow. They told us how to grow maize. Uh, they taught us navigation, cosmology, geometry, astronomy, how, how to develop a magnetic compass. They uh, influenced our written languages. Uh, they taught the Sumerians uh, about smelting and agriculture. The, uh, that, that's a cross-cultural theme. Tutors from heaven. Now, here is... A psycholo I'm a psychologist, and I'd just like to make this point, okay? Think about this as a template for understanding all this. In 1942 or so, a man named John, who said he was from, I think, California or someplace, uh, was flying a Cessna over the Caroline Islands in the South Pacific, and they had never seen an airplane. And he landed his plane and brought what they called cargo, an Agatha Christie novel, I guess some candy bars, and they called him John Frum. Now, they have deified John Frum. He was from California, but they call him John Frum. And every year, they have taken this guy who was like, to them, a sky god, who came from space, who had uh, incredible technology. They make their own a replica of his aircraft. They create a runway and they celebrate John Frum Day. I think it's February 13th. They wait for the second coming of John Frum. They wait all day 
and all night, and they have this mythology, this religious mythology, that John Frum will return, he will come back, the second coming of John Frum, and he will bring with him goodies and refrigerators and cement houses, and he will bring them salvation, okay? So we think, oh, that's superstitious thinking, that's primitive thinking. He was just a guy from, probably from California with a Cessna, and they've made a bamboo replica of a Cessna. But the question about the, the cargo cult of the Caroline Islands is this. Is this, the template here, the psychological template is when you meet a creature that comes with incredible technology from, from space, from the sky, there's a tendency to deify that person, to turn them into gods, and to uh, imagine their return, their second coming. So what happens with John Frum? Is that what happened with Zeus? Is that what happens with Osiris and Horus and all the other gods uh, that uh, our human mythology d describes? That is a very important question. Let's look at archaeology. How is that changed if we accept the fact that extraterrestrials have visited? Well, we have a lot of rock art that we don't, uh, we kind of ignore. Uh, these are rock figurines from Niger, from Bulgaria, they're from Utah, Australia. They sure look like strange creatures, helmeted creatures, uh, extraterrestrial creatures. Uh, having antennas, large eyes, large heads, uh, and they're scribbled on rocks all throughout this earth, okay? They could draw better than that, okay? But what are they drawing? What are they describing? Why, uh, okay, in, in my first book, which is called Aliens and Man, uh, I came across an Indian rock art which I thought was really kind of cool. There's a guy who looks like he's got a helmet. If you see on, on, his, on the right side of that picture, uh, something that looks like a UFO with little drops hanging down and like electrical force fields going up. Well, I couldn't find the, the source. I couldn't be sure that this was not some kind of a hoax. So in this book, I really wanted to find out who, where is this? I know it's somewhere in, in India and I, but the guy who discovered it was named Wasim Khan. I couldn't find him. But I kept at it. And I said, where is he from? Does he have a PhD? Is he an archaeologist? Is this fake? Is it a hoax? I found, foundly, it took me four months, but I got in touch with Dr. Wasim Khan, who is a tribal archaeologist, who said that cave does exist. And uh, that art does exist. And it's not fake. Okay. So I included that. Now, we also talk about the Great Pyramid. I, was, I actually visited the Great Pyramid there. So here are things that are very mysterious. The Great Pyramid is built of, uh, not at the end of Egyptian culture, but at the very beginning. It is the most amazing structure built by human beings for 4,400 years. Uh, there was no taller building than the Great Pyramid until the 18th century. Now, we thought we had Archimedes was the one who discovered pi and uh, the golden section, or phi, but it turns out that pi and phi were known by the Egyptians uh, 22,000 years earlier. If you multiply the height of the Great Pyramid, 146.75 meters by 1 million, the result is approximately equal to the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The weight of the Great Pyramid, 5,273,000 tons, multiplied by a billion, equals the weight of the Earth. If you divide the perimeter of the pyramid by one half its height, the result is 3.14, the famous Greek number pi, the ratio between the circumference of a circle and its radius, which would be... So, there's a lot of information encrypted in this pyramid that was built um, about 500 years 
after human beings had written language. Now, uh, there is well, there are a great number of mysteries associated with this. Here's quantum. You notice uh, the Giza pyramids are laid out with a little bit of a dog leg to the left, but people have said that Os the the belt of Orion is laid out in a very similar way. If you read the Egyptian pyramid texts, they say that Osiris, Horus, and other gods who came to Earth were from Orion, okay? The Orion Belt. Here's a famous quantum physicist. Egyptologists have often asked the question, why did the ancient Egyptians build three great pyramids that are slightly misaligned? Did they have bad ruler sticks thousands of years ago? The three pyramids seem to be aligned to the three constellation stars of Orion. What does this alignment mean? Was it a coincidence, or were the pyramids intentionally engineered this way? It has been claimed that the layout of the three major pyramids on the Giza Plateau, including the Great Pyramid, are set on the ground to mimic the three stars in Orion's belt. I uh, discovered that there are other pyramids on Earth. There are some pyramids in China, and there that's the middle picture. And if you look at the pyramids in China, which are made out of dirt, they also seem to correspond to the Orion Belt, except mainstream archaeologists, wait a minute, uh, ancient Egypt and China didn't have any connection to each other. All right, so that, that's kind of impossible. And why would they do that? Well, further research has shown that the pyramids in Mexico do the same thing. On the left are Chinese pyramids. In the middle are the Mexican pyramids. On the, on the right are the Egyptian pyramids. Why is it that we have pyramids, strange structures, in China, Mexico, and Egypt that are all doing the same thing, that are all like cities on Earth or, or structures on Earth that are reflecting the organization of the Orion Belt? Got an interesting theory to explain that? Well, mainstream archaeology doesn't like diffusionism and it doesn't explore this but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be explored and also in my book i discovered another and a foreign in in england uh, almost a thousand years before the great pyramid is built there's a henge and the henge is called thornborough henge and it is laid out almost exactly as an analog to the orion belt very interesting. You have to read this chapter. It's a, it gets a little technical here. Thornborough is 3500 BC. Giza is 2600 BC. China 150 BC. Mexico 200 BC. Why are they all doing that? So the next chapter looks at a very controversial idea, biological implications. Is it possible that our biology has been influenced by extraterrestrial contact? Well, that is not a popular topic in the academic world. Okay, but I want to explore it. I'll tell you why. For about, wait, before I tell you why, I'm a psychologist. Carl Jung uh, was a, a very famous psychiatrist. He was like uh, associated with Freud. He looked at dreams and myths differently than Freud did. He said, sometimes you have a dream. It's not hidden. It's not hiding the meaning. Just look at the dream and find out what it's telling you or w with a myth. So take a look at this picture and tell me, what is it that you're looking at? This is the nativity scene. About 33% of all human beings on earth are Christian. One denomination or the other, and they pay attention to this idea, this image, on December 25th, every year for 2,000 years. What are you looking at? Well, you're looking at a woman who was an earthling who gave birth to a child whose father was not of this earth. He was a divine being, the divine father, a sky god, okay? You're looking at a hybrid, a half-human, half-heavenly, extraterrestrial creature whose name is Jesus. That is what is fascinating you, or that's a different interpretation of what is fascinating you. So the question is, 
We have mythology that says the gods married, consorted with, uh, had children by, uh, mated with human beings. Zeus, the Japanese royal family. Uh, is any truth to that rumor? Is that all fable, all crazy? Well, we were taught in high school that human beings, Homo sapiens, are about 50,000 years old. Not true. The Omo skull was found in South Africa, and the biologically modern man is 195,000 years old. That is, you could have mated with a creature that existed 195,000 years ago on this earth uh, because it was a biologically modern man, woman, human. Okay, so that's how old we are, uh, much older than we ever thought. So when we look at human evolution, we have some problems to confront. We were very, very slow in developing culture. Our cultural advance begins about the 94th percentile of our being on this planet. The first bow and arrow are developed in 9000 BC. The first civilization, Sumer, is in the fourth millennium BC. The first written language is 3500 BC. Okay? That took an awfully long time for us to develop cognitive capacities. Why were we so retarded for so long? Physical evolution versus cultural evolution is a problem, even for mainstream archaeology. It takes 190,000 years before we get the idea of domesticating a goat. It takes 190,000 years before we get the idea of cultivating lentils or peas. It takes 191,000 years of walking on this planet before we get the idea of domesticating a pig. It takes 194,500 years before we codified our first written language. Why were we so retarded, so laggard, so slow? Well, um, that's a very interesting question. Let's take a look at how traditional explanations deal. They say, well, we suddenly got bigger frontal lobes and our brains got bigger. That's not true. You have to read my book to figure that out, but that's not true. Scientifically not true. Another theory is that the Ice Age receded about 11,000 BC. And when that ice receded, we started farming. When we started farming, there were more people who didn't have to hunt and gather, and they could develop, develop language and science and flutes and develop a wheel and invent things. Okay? However, if you critically look at that, uh, that's the Earth during the maximum ice age uh, ice age at its maximum. There were plenty of areas in East Asia, in Africa, in Central America that could have supported agriculture for thousands and thousands of years throughout the ice ages. Chimpanzees were still eating bananas at the maximum part of the ice age. Why weren't humans farming? Why weren't they growing peas and domesticating goats and horses? They had 190,000 years and they weren't doing any of that stuff. Okay, so that is a problem. Now there's a book, mainstream book, not an ET book, that I thought was interesting. It's called The 10,000 Year Explosion. This guy attempts an explanation for why we were so slow. And I liked his book, and I think it's a reasonable theory. He says this, the Ice Age recedes, we develop agriculture, the population Here's a graph. It goes up and up and up and up. As population increases, genetic diversity increases. Mutations increase. Smarter genes develop more rapidly. I thought that was a reasonable traditional explanation for how we get smarter so quickly. Because Darwin, Darwinian evolution doesn't happen overnight. It takes 150,000 years for a chimpanzee big toe to turn into a human big toe. Darwinian evolutionary time is quite long. Why are we so smart so quickly? 
the amount of time from the first bow and arrow to traveling in space is only about 10,000 years. All right, but that said, there is another alternative theory for how humans got so smart, and that is because the gods got involved. They taught us, they tweaked us, they genetically interbred, they edited our genome, who knows? But there is an awful lot of literature that says that. Okay, the Book of Enoch, the Egyptian pyramid texts, all of these books talk about how the gods were involved in the development of human culture and learning and language. Uh, the Mayan Popovu, the Greek Hesiod's Theogony, uh, the, the god Zeus mating with the mortals, Persia, the Shaname, China, uh, Sumerian, the Epic of Gilgamesh, India, the Reg Veta, uh, Babylonia, and Numa Elis, the Elopian Kebreda, uh, Nagast. Those are all ancient books that are saying one and only one thing. The gods interacted with our species and made us the way we are. Now there, I wanted to pursue this and I, there is a creature called Mungo Man found in Australia. This is the oldest fossil that has retrievable human DNA. It's first thought to be 60,000 years old, now it's 42,000. Okay, this is the oldest biologically modern man where we can look and see the DNA. And guess what? It's not what we expected. It's not like our own. So some people argue, well, maybe it was a different species of human, of Homo sapien. Okay. All right. But uh, our, it appears that our DNA has changed since Mungo Man. That's the point. So what, where do we get these new genes that make us so smart? The mainstream hypothesis is in that book, The 10,000 Year Explosion. Mutations caused by rapidly increasing population, which in turn is caused by agriculture. But the other hypothesis is the mythological extraterrestrial hypothesis that says the gods came, interbred, taught us, changed us, and altered our our biological composition. Okay. Now, but there was one last chapter of this book on crop circles. Is it possible that the gods have been trying to communicate with us and we're, not, we're ignoring it? I mean, we see these strange things in our fields and we say, the majority of Americans say, no, no, these, those were made by people. They're all man-made. They are really, really cool, though. Really, really intricate. Very hard to do in wheat. How do they do them? What is involved? Uh, and I wanted to explore, as one of the most speculative chapters in my book, what if these aren't man-made? What if these, we need to look at these as very abstract communications coming from someplace else? Here is a, a, a YouTube video where the UFO people say crop circles are not all made by man. Some of them are made by balls of light that come from space. This could be a hoaxed video. It could be the truth. Watch it very carefully. There's a couple of lights down there somewhere. This controversial film appears to show strange objects hovering above a cornfield. Below, complex circle formations appear. Retired so are, are aliens etch-a-sketching uh, uh, in our farm fields and uh, sending us messages? Well, I decided to uh, at a couple crop circles and, and consult with scientists if I could find them and help me de decode them. Like, take a look. I'm just going to do one here. There's a crop circle. Very pretty. It's about 180 feet long. Huge. I have no idea what it means, except that uh, if you count the rings, there are two uh, rings in the inner circle and three rings in the outer circle. And you say, my God, how would I ever decode this? Well, I'm a realist, so I noticed that that crop circle is standing or f lying right next to an open pit chalk mine. Who would make a crop circle near an open pit chalk mine in England? Why? What's it supposed to mean? Maybe it has something to do with chalk. 
So I thought, what is chalk? Chalk is calcium carbonate. Okay, well, let's take a look. Calcium carbonate has three oxygen atoms, and the outer circle has three white wing, I'm sorry, three white rings. So, oh, maybe it's talking, and, and what's the other circle? The inner circle has two rings. And I thought, well, what has two rings? Water has two white rings. So is that a statement about calcium carbonate and water? Well, it could be a number of things. It could be just a pretty piece of jewelry. Uh, you know, I don't know. But uh, talk to some scientists who are experts on calcium carbonate. And uh, if you say crop circles, they won't talk to you. But if you say, I'm interested in calcium carbonate, how is it made up? Somebody would say, yeah, calcium carbonate is the ingredient in cement. Mix it with water and uh, other things and you create cement. Cement industry is one of the primary producers of carbon dioxide. In fact, it is one of the two largest producers of carbon dioxide, creating up to 5% of worldwide man-made emissions of this gas. As one writer put it, a single industry accounts for 5% of global carbon dioxide emissions. Huh. So, are they putting a crop circle near a chalk mine to say cement is bad for the environment? Here's a graph of global cement production. It's not slowing down at all. This industry is probably one of the greatest contributors uh, to towards global warming, and it or certainly a serious one. So, does that crop circle have something to say about cement and global warming? That's the question. And was it made by man, or was it made by E.T.? Okay, now, I told you this was speculative, but if, if this was made by environmental activists who are concerned about global warming and cement, wouldn't they write in English, stop cement production now? Why would they leave a, an abstract figure like that? Wouldn't they just say it in English? Stop cement production. And that's a cement, a, a chalk mine. And if, if, uh, if you really wanted to do it, if you were Chinese, they're the largest producers of cement. Well, you could write that in Chinese. Stop cement production now. Except that's probably harder to do in wheat. So if that circle has something to do with cement production and global warming and CO2, I don't think it was made by human beings who are concerned about the environment. Do you? Maybe it was made by somebody else who's concerned about the environment. Now, I have a very unexpected conclusion to this whole book and this whole talk. Okay, so get ready. This is a strange ending to this talk. And I, I wrote to hundreds of scientists, academicians, to get feedback on this book. First of all, probably, four, I, I made this tally myself. About 14 out of every 15 professors that I wrote, who I, who I emailed, refused any further contact with me as soon as they learned I was asking about Roswell or about UFOs or about the Roswell foil or about crop circles. As soon as they heard that, they just broke off all contact. This is a very forbidden topic. So I learned my lesson and I said, okay, I need to, there is a crop, a crop circle, but I used it as a diagram. And it has a sequence of 11 to 12 circles on the inside, 14 and 18 circles on the outside, with little two dots next to every one. And I asked a mathematician, what is this? What is the mathematics here? And he said, my God, that is <coughs> fascinating. He said 11, 12, 14, 18 is an integer sequence that may go out to infinity up or may go to infinity down. It has something to do with prime numbers and the power of two. And I said, I don't really understand you. Uh, could you try to explain that to me in more common language? He said, well, I, uh, I will, but I want to know, where did you get this? And so I thought I would confide in him, and I told him it came from a crop circle. You can see a little person standing in the center of this amazingly complex and beautiful crop circle. I said it came from a crop circle. 
Guess what he wrote back? He said, well, that says it all as far as I'm concerned. And that was it. No more communication. No more discussion of integer sequences, the power of two prime numbers, nothing. So that's what happens. And that's part of the conclusion. We have a tremendous level of bias against this hypothesis, especially in the academic world. So the feeling of ridicule, of scorn, and that you are a nutcase involved in nutty things is ever present in this work. This is what Copernicus said. Copernicus, therefore, when I considered this carefully, the contempt which I had to fear because of the novelty and apparent absurdity of my view nearly induced me to abandon utterly the work that I had begun. That is the feeling that you have when you're serious about this topic. You know your friends think you're crazy. You know that there are people who are going to come out of the word, woodwork and say, that's false, that's false, that. No matter how much evidence you bring, how many generals you have. So the question we are really asking is, do we want the truth or we are, are we afraid of the truth? Do we hold on to these delusions because it gives us some comfort? 79% of the American people believe the government is withholding the truth about UFOs. You would think... Eight out of ten Americans want to know the truth. Is that true? They seem to want to know the truth. The academic world, on the other hand, is absolutely adamant in its opposition. UFOs and all of that stuff just doesn't exist. Okay, and stop it. Okay, stop saying the pyramids were built by aliens or influenced by aliens. It's just more pop archaeology, pseudo-archaeology. So my conclusion was, from this exercise, that our sciences, archaeology, anthropology, evolutionary biology, ancient history, mythology, would be shaken to the core if we accepted this belief. Everything would be up for grabs. Everything would change. Professor Alan Hynek said, this is after he recanted, I believe that it will prove to be not merely the next small step in the march of science, but a mighty and totally unexpected quantum jump. I agree. This is extremely revolutionary. This thought is bigger than Copernicus. This is the biggest um, uh, admission of the truth in our age. So we are fascinated with aliens is it time for the truth, or is it, is, will there be too much cognitive dissonance? We like to have movies about them and see them, but the reality is different than the fantasy. Okay, There's a Brookings report. The government um, in the 50s asked, obviously for some reason, they asked the Rand Corporation, what would happen if you told the American people that UFOs existed? And the Rand Corporation's Brookings report said uh, it's not a good idea. It would cause considerable cognitive dissonance, particularly in primitive cultures. But we believe that it would be very destabilizing. Okay, Alvin Toffler, who wrote the book Future Shock, was interviewed and asked what would happen if people were told that UFOs actually existed. And he said, I think it would be very disturbing. It would be very destabilizing. I do not think we are ready. I think that it would be, uh, uh, it, it would be quite catastrophic for the psychology of human beings and for, sus, for societies, not just America, but for other societies too. So a National Geographic poll actually asked people, what would happen if you learn that UFOs actually existed? How would you feel? 20% of Americans said they would be nervous and afraid. Okay, So it's not as pretty a picture of, oh, our fantasies are coming true as we think. There are very serious consequences to this. So I'm concluding this lecture with a strange story. Okay, the question is, are we in denial and holding too fast to our materialism and our scientific delusion that there are no such things? And are we not really ready for the truth? So George Bush's, the father, George Bush, 
um, decided to help his son Jeb. Jeb's running for the Republican nomination. He's not doing well. His dad comes in a wheelchair. He's going to support Jeb. So he wheels himself out on stage, and a guy asks a question. He sneaks a question, and he asks this question, and as soon as George Bush asked, answered the question, they got him off stage and wheeled him away and say, no, 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 uh, our Jeb Bush's feelings are not the same as his father, as if his father's crazy. Now, George Bush was old. He may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he was also the president of the United States, and he was also the head of the CIA. And the question that is asked is, Mr. F President Bush, when is the government going to tell the truth about UFOs? Well, you don't get to ask the president that question much. Here was his answer. Americans aren't ready for the truth. I think that very much could be the case. Thank you very much for watching.